That's, uh, well, let's go ahead and kick this off. Um, this is uh, David Walton. Really appreciate you coming on. You know, special forces for guy. Having. Yeah, we were talking. You got to have a mindset. Successful people in the military and in the real world, like we were talking before, and maybe I'll add that part in too. But you were saying how you're just kind of figuring everything out, like, and that's kind of what it is. And that's, I think, a lot of people don't realize that the su successful people that they see or people that that are doing things that they're like, man, you know, I wish I could do that. Those people aren't anything special. They're just like figuring it out. And half the time they're sweating through it because they don't know if it's going to work out or not. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, I think a lot of us like to think that like, hey, I just I like to be a winner. And, and that's a that's a noble mentality. But I think most of us really hate to lose. Mm -hmm. And when we when we see an opportunity that we can't take advantage of, we feel like we've lost something and it, like like angers you, like pisses you off. Like, God, I, I want that to happen again. And that's what strives us to be sort of high performers. And the psychology of high performers is very consistent with that. It's not that they'd like love to win. It's they hate to lose. They obsess over the details. I, you know, I've, I've heard it's been on the, in my motivational social media feeds lately. It's, it's this notion of professionals, um, professionals do it not until they get it right, but until they can't get it wrong mm -hmm. because be getting wrong, losing feels worse than, then winning feels good. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think a hundred percent, I think a, a lot of people have that mindset, especially in the military, especially when you get into combat arms and then even more so as you move up to like through special operations, special, you know, like through the different tiers there, because you don't want to be the guy, you know, the worst guy on the team. It doesn't matter if you're with Delta, there's always a worse guy on the team. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And although you're like at the pinnacle there, you're still probably going to feel like shit because all the other people that are around you are doing so much better than you are. It's just, um, I don't know. It's, it's a weird but game, in, right? In, in my mind, the, my notion was I never want and the unit, whatever the unit is, the team, the, the company, the, the platoon, whatever. I never want them to be waiting on me. So I never want to be late. I never want to be last. I never want to be light. Like I, I always want to be, uh, I don't have to be the first guy. I don't have to be the best guy because that's almost impossible to do when you're in a group of hyper um, uh, hyper elite guys. Uh, but I don't want to be the last. I don't want, I don't want to be the reason why the mission failed. Mm -hmm. And and that's a, that, that that's peer pressure. And that's a great motivation. You know, shame is a, is a powerful tool if we use it correctly. So yeah, a hundred percent. And it's not even, it doesn't even have to be like cadre or your leadership shaming you. That internal shame is so powerful. I mean, some people don't have any shame, right? But a lot of people look clearly. at something and they're like, yeah, clearly. But a lot of people look at something and and if they don't do well or they don't they don't operate at the level that they know they can and something bad happens or, you know, the outcome isn't what they wanted, you look at that and go, fuck, man. You know, there's some shame in that because you're like, I could have done better. Like, I could have gotten the results I wanted had I really put out, you know, I don't know. It's uh, again, yeah, like, like, well, I mean, and, and I think in psychological terms, we call that intrinsic motivation. You know, mm -hmm. I don't need external motivation. If I need a cadre to motivate me, like, why am I there? Like, I, like, I, I need to be pushing myself. And it's particularly in a small unit, you know, an ankle code unit or a soft unit. Like you, you don't have the luxury of a bunch of dudes over you, a big structure to motivate you. Like you got to get it done on your own. And, and, uh, and that's, that is both incredibly stressful and incredibly freeing because it's like, Hey man, I am the limiter. I, I decide what I can and can't do. I, so I, I, it's all on me. And, and uh, it's for a lot of guys, that's really empowering, but for a lot of guys, that's really intimidating. And I think one of the reasons that one of the big reasons that most guys don't, don't, uh, don't strive for these elite units, these elite positions is because, they self-select out. They 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 just decide that they're not good enough for it. And it's like okay, then maybe that's the best thing because uh, now we don't have to worry about you. Yeah, a hundred percent. I uh, man, it's it blows my mind the defeatist attitude that so many people have. You know, I'm a realist. I'll never go be a hundred meter sprinter in the Olympics. I got it. But there's stuff out there that I look at and go, why not me? You know what I'm saying? Like if you're gonna do something, then why not be? I don't know why. Give me just one second. I'm going to pause this real quick. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll jump back on. Give me one second. My The wind just blew real hard and blew my door open. <laughs> That's never happened before. That's funny. I, I should have locked it, I guess. Um, so, yeah, like I was saying, um, but this defeatist attitude that a lot of people have, it's like, I don't know, man. I look at I look at cool jobs and go, why not? You know, if I'm shooting, if I'm a, 
if I'm in college or something like that, and I'm looking to be a military officer and I want to go be a pilot, why not have the attitude of why, why can't I be an F-35 pilot that does this? You know, if you go into it and go, that'll never be me, then yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If you start out with like, no, nah, that'll never be me, then you are correct. It'll never be it, you. It, it, that's one of the things that's been um, uh, really surprising about the book that I wrote, Rock Up or Shut Up, is that I've had a ton of guys reach out to me um, that's followed me on social media and kind of knew about me and done, known about some of my research before. And then they read this book about special forces assessment and selection. And, and they literally said that, why not me? And they write to me and say, I like, I now know this is possible. Like I wasn't even thinking that I could be that guy. And now I'm like, now I have a pathway to do it. And that's really empowering. Like it, it's also intimidating for me. Cause I'm like, gosh, I, I better not lie. I better not fuck this up. Or I'm going to, I'm going to screw up. I'm going to screw a couple of thousand dudes who are going to go to selection and get their asses handed to them. So I got to make certain that I get this right. But, um, but a lot of guys are just, they're, they're sort of realizing like, Hey, this is something that's in the realm of possibility. I, I grew up on the GWAT. I, you know, I, I have on social media, I see all these cool guys doing cool guy things and never thought it was possible. And now it's possible. And, and venues like this, like your podcast, and, 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 and social media, like it is opening this world of possibility to guys that never really thought that possible. And that's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. It's uh, taking away that like superhero mystique of some of these like jobs and stuff. And, 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 you know, you realize that a lot of these guys are just regular Joes, you know, they're just regular dudes, you know, outside of the military and the crazy training they've gone through in the military, they were just a dude that played on their base, you know, high school baseball team, or they were into cars or something like that. And they just decided to join yeah. the military. And now, and now they're at whatever level it is that they're at, but you know, it is possible hundred percent. You know, it's, it's good. I like, I like how all the information is out there. You know, when I was, when I was growing up, I was going to be, it was almost set that I was going to join the military. It was just kind of mm -hmm. not because anyone pushed it on me just because of my being, my dad was military. It was, I was around it. I saw him go to the Gulf war. It was just something I was into. Um, but there's not a lot of information out there. Like I had to read books, you know, I had to go to the library, the public library and find books about different jobs and learn about like Carlos Hathcock or, you know, learn about Navy SEALs and what they do or, and, you know, and there was a couple documentaries and stuff, but now people can find out like the specific job they want. And there's probably a social media account that caters to that specific job, but you can get a realistic idea of, of like what you're going to be doing, you know? Yeah, you can. And, and I was the same way when I was coming up, I, I knew I wanted to be in the military. I, I knew I wanted to be a commando. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know, I didn't know what a green beret was. I, I you know, peripherally, you know, it, but Social media didn't exist. Hell, the internet didn't exist, you know, until I, I, I mean, I graduated uh, high school in 1988. The internet wasn't even a thing. So, like, I, I always knew I wanted to be a commando and do cool guy stuff, but I didn't know how to do that or what it really looked like. So I, I just kind of was kind of coasting through. And I said, so I, that's when I joined the Army, and I just was just, you know, like, that's got to be a pathway to get there. But but I didn't know it was possible. And now it's like you just, you know, search on your phone. You have in the in your pocket, you have limitless knowledge to anything that you want, whatever your niche thing is. If you want to be a, a PJ, a CCT guy, an SR guy, a Green Beret, a Marsoc Raider, like there is a thousand web pages all catering to it. And they've got high def videos and, and super produced videos on it. And it's just like, Man, it's it's it is it's the problem now is not access to information. It's how do you make sense of all that information? Mm -hmm. And and frankly, how do you how do you manage the disinformation? And that was that's really why I got into this. Why I got into the 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 book and the and, and my social media presence was was that I, I I was shocked. You know, you you never realize how much the media gets wrong until they write about a subject that you know about personally, mm -hmm. and then you're just like, oh well, they totally screwed that up. So uh, you read these reports and, and see social media posts uh, of, of, frankly, a lot of retirees, a lot of Green Beret retirees, and they would say things like, you know, they were just blatantly false. And, and, and what I started to see was, is that there were young guys that were thinking about the future as a Green Beret, and they would read these posts, and, and uh, you know, retirees would just be 
dogging these kids and telling them all this bad information. And these kids would say, well, I'm, I'm not even going to bother going to selection now because I, I don't, I don't have a shot. I, I, there's no way I'm going to make it because, because I can't, you know, I can't run four minute miles and, and I can't carry 200 pound rucksacks. And I was like, there is no time ever in the pipeline where you have to uh, carry a 200 pound ruck or run a four minute mile. Your ruck may get heavy, but I don't know if it'll get 200 pounds. Yeah. So I, so I saw, I, I was, it was, we were sort of beating ourselves on a technicality. I mean, recruiting is hard on a good day. 77% of Americans, uh, military age Americans are not eligible to serve in the military. I heard you talking about this with uh, some of the Marsoc guys and, and, um, you guys were batting between 70% or 75%. So in 1980, uh, I'm sorry, in 2018, it was 70%. DOD reported 70% uh, of Americans were not eligible to serve in the military. The, a study came out about three months ago, and it's up to 77%. So in that sh five short years, we went up 7%. Maybe some of that's because of COVID and all that. Some of that's certainly because of the Genesis um, health screening system at, at the at the MEPS. But but like like we're in a recruiting crisis, and and in special operations we have higher standards. So we are in a recruiting crisis inside of a recruiting crisis. So we can't afford to have any misinformation out there. So I started posting about like here's here's the reality. Here's the reality of of special forces assessment selection. Here's the reality of life on a team. Here's what it's like for families and 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 all that stuff. And the response has been, man, I need more of this good information. So that that's kind of what drove me into this. Yeah, the retirees um, like to maintain the mystique, you know. Like if I could, if I tell you, well, yeah, man, I was climbing all hills, two hundred pound rock, uh, you know. It's like, whoa, you're a badass, e dude. You know, like uh, everybody, everybody went to the last hard course, right? The old old school guys were the hardest. The new school guys are just giving it away. I love the guys that talk about like it, it's everything too. It's not just like selection or anything like that. It's like guys that were in Iraq. They were like, man, it was one hundred and twenty five degrees when I was there. I'm like, no, it wasn't, dude. That would be like a, literally a world record like that. Right. I don't know what jank, like, you know, thermometer you were using, but it definitely was not 125 degrees. It's everybody likes to church up, you know, make it the, you, when you get on social media, it's just toxic, you know, and you have, right. and the unfortunate part is, is the, on social media, the same, the, the same people don't really say much. It's the insane people that come out and start putting their crazy right. opinions out there. Like you're talking about and right. dissuading people. Hey, the service has changed. This is this is going on. This is no, you know, this. I don't know. It's it's a weird landscape. It's one that the Department of Defense is, you know, right now they're trying to navigate it. I think it's really good that there's a lot of. I know a lot of the organizations that have selections and stuff like that. A lot of the training commands have social media accounts and show like the training in action. I know one that I follow is the uh, re recon training, um, the recon training course. I can't, I'm, that's the, not the right name for it, but it's a re recon training school. But they're going through all the, or the basic reconnaissance course. Uh, they show video of the classes going through the pool phase or going through, you know, surf or whatever. And it's like, okay. You know, and as me in 1999, I would never have had access to see or, you know, see what they're, I would only have heard stories second or third hand or through a book or something like that. That's been diluted by, you know, publishers or whatever. Uh, so I think it's great. I, I love the access to information. You know, you said you came in and you were 88 or that's when you graduated high school. Did you come right in? Yeah. So I graduated high school in 88. Uh, I went off to college. I actually joined the Army Reserves in 1991 in the middle of the Gulf War. Nice. You know, I was like over uh, overwhelmed with patriotism and said I got to get in a fight. Mm -hmm. and I, in my mind, I remember sitting in in the MEP station as the tanks were crossing the berm for the big war. I don't think that's how it actually happened, but in my mind, I built myself up to be a hero that way. But um, so I, I joined in 91, and then I, I graduated college and commissioned in 1993, and uh, uh, went into the. I was an armored guy I was a cav guy um down down at fort hood and uh and i didn't go special operations until 1997 that's when i went to selection and uh, so i've been at this game for about 25 years now uh real uh, quick real quick before you go on I, I don't want this to turn into like a political thing 
but this is a it's a current event they're changing the names of the bases they just changed because you said fort hood they changed it to something else i think it's i think it's cavazos what is i and this seems to be mainly an issue with the army bases i don't think i think it's only army bases that they're changing the names of so, so my my buy-in isn't as much i mean i've been to fort bragg multiple times i spent many many a night sleeping in the field in fort bragg um but where where have you been what was the name of that base oh uh, yeah fort liberty never the the name the way they said that that name came up that they were like this is how it came up it was like uh we were in a name meeting you know naming meeting whatever trying to figure out what the name was and someone said liberty and everyone started chanting it that was what was in the news article when they were they released how the name and i was like there's no fucking way that that happened can you imagine can you imagine being at a meeting at, at fort bragg where you know all the senior folks are there 18 so who's that for brag so the 18th airborne corps three-star command the 82nd airborne division is here and then Sp army special operations is here so there's a there's a ton of stars here there's a ton of 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 uh of big 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 rank big ego commands here can you imagine a rooms of, of those or those people or representatives of those people sitting around chanting liberty I, that is it's that's so, so asinine. It's unbelievable. Whoever whoever came up with that little story is probably the same person that came up with the idea of liberty. So it, it's so not only did they change the name for Brad, let we let's recognize that there is some merit in not naming your your bases after Confederate war generals. Well, I we we understand that that's a that was that was a a decision that was made back in the day to to placate um the southern states is that what it, okay um, that's what i was going to ask because i never even knew what the original conversation because i think fort bragg was established in 1918 and so i was like i wondered what the contemporary conversation about that naming you know the name then right was. yeah so i mean that's all you know fort bragg fort benning fort hood they were all named after after southern generals and the the the, the legend is i don't i don't know how true it is i've never actually seen documentation on it. I don't know that there would be actual documentation on that, but my understanding is, is that it was, it was a concession to the Southern States to sort of ease the, ease the sting of, of losing, uh, of, of losing the, the civil war. So, but, but so I, I've been at Fort Bragg since, since 97, uh, did 16 of my 20 years active duty here. And I, um, and then I retired here and, and in all of my time, I have never heard a single person discuss Fort Bragg in terms of its its namesake of General Braxton Bragg, who was named after, who was a con by all accounts a a not a very good Confederate uh, field artillery general. So people identify. My understanding is that people identified Fort Bragg much more with its roots in the 82nd and, and special operations than they did with its roots in some sort of Confederate lineage. Right. So I, I don't, I don't think that, 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 that the argument that it, we should rename it because it, it hurts people of color or marginalized peoples. Cause I don't think there's any merit in that. I don't, th I've never heard a, I, I, I know many marginalized people and people of color that have lived and work and, and, and have a, a, a real connection of Fort Bragg have never brought up the fact that Braxton Bragg uh, is, is the namesake. So, uh, so it, it bears no, it bears no merit in, in my mind. And m maybe there is, maybe there's a small percentage, but I, I just don't think it's certainly not worth the money, the $27 million that it cost to change it. And, and, and the logo and, they made was horrible. Like the gate, oh, the gate brother, sign. The, that looked yeah, like they got a graphic designer off Fiverr, you know, that is the worst thing. And when you, so you, you've seen the pictures of it, <laughs> when you see it in person, it's like cheap plastic. I mean, and it like, it looks like it's ready to fall apart and they just unveiled it. That's it crazy. is atrocious. It's and they probably paid that. a crazy amount for it. Listen up. If you need graphic design work, jkramergraphics.com is the place. <laughs> Hit me up. That was some garbage work. I got a, done a better logo for him than that because, but yeah, horrible. I just wanted, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned Fort Hood. So I just wanted to get, you know, I guess we're the retirees we were just talking about, but you know, I, I honestly didn't even know that they were named after Confederate generals until the whole controversy came up. And I was like, Oh, really? That's like, the point. I was yeah. like, Oh yeah. I was like, you see, so I, but I also, I get, I completely get the people that were stationed there and they're like, it'll always be Fort Bragg. It's like when I was at Lejeune 
they came out and they're like, it's, they tried to make a change or like, it's actually pronounced Lejeune. It's John A. Lejeune. Someone, someone started pronouncing his name incorrectly at some point and it caught on. And they were like, from now on, it needs to be referred to as Lejeune. Like it was like a whole thing. And they were putting signs up. Like, this is how you say it. Like when you go into the PX or whatever, this is how you say honor the man, John Lejeune, you know? And like, Everyone that's ever been stationary is like, I'm never going to call it that. That's not what it's called. Like it was, it's called Camp Lejeune. You know what I'm saying? And it's, I, you can I try all you want, will, but yeah, I, I don't think I will ever call Fort Bragg anything other than Fort Bragg. If for nothing else, that's because just by muscle memory, that's what I've been saying for 25 years. Yeah. So I just don't know. I just don't know. And, and Liberty, the, the name Liberty is so bad. At least the other installations, they got new names for sure. And, 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 and there, there is, I mean, we had a massive pool of Dude. legitimate heroes to, to pick from. So many. And, but, so so I think the problem was is you've got a three-star Airborne Command and a three-star Special Operations Command, and they butted heads, and they couldn't decide on one. So they went with Liberty. I, I just That's a total cop-out. Pick one. I, I can't Im- – if you'd have picked an Airborne guy, I can't imagine too many soft guys would have been too pissed about it. Same thing if, if it had been like Roy Benavidez. I mean, that guy is – by the way – all special forces guys are airborne. So you kind of tick both boxes. So it just, it has no merit in my mind. Yeah. It's pretty wild. It's funny. It's, I mean, and how much of that, you know, millions of dollars spent on that could have been turned around and, and used for like troop welfare improvement of like facilities or something. You know what I'm saying? Like and, and, there's so much Fort stuff. Has been, yeah. We've been under the gun for the last couple, about a year now for really bad mold in the barracks, mm. like really bad. And, uh, and, and the, the, the seniors sort of kind of brushed it under the carpet and dudes were leg- like, dudes were pissed and, and legitimately had a grievance there. And it's like, and they were like, well, you know, we're working on it. And, and they completely inconvenienced the Joes that they moved out of the barracks, made a move like, you know, in the, in the dark of the night and, 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 and to complete inconvenience. And then they dropped 27 mil on new signs and new signs. They, like they didn't just rename Fort Bragg installation. They also renamed like, like 13 streets on Fort Bragg mm. because they had, they had connections named. So like, it's, it's a fairly significant investment and, and that's going to cause and, some and, confusion for a little bit. Well, but it's funny because my, my GPS updated before I even, I even realized they changed the names. I was like, what is that? Like, so, I, but the, the point on that whole thing is, is that to what end, to what end did, 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 have we ended racism? Is that a legitimate step towards ending racism or are we just keeping it up? We're just shoving it into everybody's faces. I, I would much rather see authentic leadership addressing the legitimate issues that are present, mm-hmm. not renaming bases, because I don't think that gets you off the X. I, 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 I think it's it's actually counterproductive because what it does is now that creates this narrative of that we are now talking about it and we are not talking about real issues. Yeah. So it's like, okay, good. We, we haven't solved any problems. You just created new ones we can talk about and 100%. then we can campaign off of. So congratulations, everyone. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you, man. There were so many so many names that could have been chosen. Fort Bragg being changed to, to Liberty was uh, particularly egregious. So I did want to discuss that. So you were you were a, a armored cav guy. How was that for you? Very cool. I, I, I came in at just the right time. I, I showed up to my unit. I was in the 3rd Brigade down in, uh, down in Fort Hood. And um, uh, we were just transitioning... So we were in the middle of a couple of key events. We were getting ready to go to a gunnery. So in, in the armored world, the coolest things are gunnery because you get to shoot the tanks, uh, shoot the big guns, and go into NTC, which which sounds bizarre to say that out loud because NTC is is a shithole. <laughs> yeah. But but that was that was where you got to go and do maneuver stuff. That's where you got to go go be an armor guy. And and we were in the midst of a um, of a of a, a long extended training calendar where we were, do, we, were do, we were doing gunnery and an NTC rotation. And then my unit, my battalion got selected to field the M1A2s, which is the newest at that point, the newest tank. And it, it was new because it had a, had a, an independent command commanders, independent thermal viewer. It was this sort of separate little turret on top of the tank. So the gunner could track targets with the main gun and you as the commander could be on, on your joystick tur- putting this, thermal viewer on the next target and as soon as he fired his round you'd push a button and the gun would slew immediately to the new 
target. You could you could kill targets as fast as you could, literally as fast as you could you could identify them. And we got selected to be the field, fielding that new tank, and that meant another gunnery and another NTC rotation. So like as soon as I got to my unit, I literally spent three years in the field. We would go to the field on a Monday morning. They'd truck us out to the field. We our tanks would be waiting on us. We'd we'd maneuver all week long. Um, doing all the fun, cool guy stuff. And then Friday afternoon, we'd park all the tanks online out in the training areas. And we'd, uh, and they'd truck us back uh, to, uh, you know, back home. You'd get the weekend off. You could, you know, shit, shower, shave, and and uh, get a good hot meal. And then Monday morning, right back at it again. And I did that for, for almost three years. And then on top of that, at the end of my three years, we, uh, we got to do a, a, a no-notice deployment to Kuwait. Saddam was making a run for the border again. And they deployed us over there. I got to do that. So my, my three years as a tanker, um, while not at all preparatory for the world of special operations, was good because it taught me, uh, you know, living in the field and uh, and learning my troop leading procedures. You know, when you're a young officer, you don't know much. You know, you know, like two things, you know, you know how to PT because because uh, it's free and every so every every uh, every ROTC uh, program does a lot of PT because it's free and easy. Uh, and then, you know, like basic troop leading procedures. So that's all I knew. And then I show up to my unit and what do I get to do? I get to go to the field where it's physically demanding. So my PT pays off and I get to do a bunch of troop leading procedures. So like I spent three years, like getting really, really good at the like junior level officer stuff. And I had some great mentors. I had some amazing, uh, platoon sergeants and, and squad leaders and tank commanders that like took me under my wing. They were like, Hey, this Walton kid's pretty good. He's he's willing to shut his mouth and, and open his ears. I'm gonna I'm gonna speak some wisdom to him. So I learned a ton under the best environments possible, um, and uh, and and sort of it didn't I, I won't say it set me, set me up operationally to be successful and soft, but it set me up sort of metaphysically. Like like I had my psychology was correct because I was humbled mm-hmm. and I was uh, and I was willing to do hard work, and that's that's really sort of the 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 cornerstone for a young good soft recruit. So I was there, and so when I went to selection, my physical fitness paid off, obviously, and I had kind of the right attitude. So it, it was a, a an amazing experience. Um, uh, but but I don't know if the, if you could replicate it again just because we, it's expensive. You know, you fire yeah. up a tank, it's a giant jet engine. It's expensive to take a tank battalion to the field, and we literally lived in the field for three years and deployed all over and just had a just an amazing experience. So I, I don't know if you could replicate that today. It probably gives you a really good handle on logistics, the pain of logistics, because like artillery, armor is a logistics hog. Yeah, yeah. You know they say that. Uh, um, uh, what is it? Not novices talk tactics and, and professionals talk, uh, logistics, something along those lines. But, you, you know, it's funny because in, in my time in the, in the cavalry, I also, uh, got a, a year as a rifle platoon leader in a mechanized rifle platoon. So I was in an infantry company. I was an armor guy in an infantry company, um, just, just by virtue of some, some, some good, bad luck. And, and, and all, so all the other officers there, were um, infantry guys and they had a light infantry background and I had this armored background and these guys are thrown into this mechanized armor world where logistics is king, right? You know, your, your operational readiness rate and how you get fuel, how you do, uh, uh, how you do log pack or how you do your logistics package is a, is defines how good you are as a unit. And I got, so I, I show up and, and that's just sort of tools of the trade. That's what I learned in my, in my basic school. And these guys are, all they know how to do is, is do uh, air assaults and airborne and light infantry stuff. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, the logistics part of it. And, and my understanding of the logistics at that point was, was, was uh, minuscule at best, but, but I had a better understanding than they did. So I sort of enjoyed this elevated position. I could talk about gunnery and, and services and, and maintenance and all that stuff. And uh, so, so it was a very unique position, and I and and I got to understand that domain of of professional soldiering that a lot of other guys wouldn't. So I I, I did uh, I did have a little bit of an advantage in that regards. 
going through Army officer training. So the, in the Marine Corps, all the officers go through OCS, and then they go through TBS, which is the basic school. And in and, yeah. and the basic school, they're learning about basically all the combat arms. They get they get an opportunity to call for fire. They're doing patrols. They're doing you know ambushes and all these different things. Does the Army do something equivalent? I mean, this is every officer. This isn't just combat arms officer. Every Marine like logistics yeah. officer has led a patrol before, even if it's you know. So at a very minimum, they can do that if called upon. Does the Army do something similar, or do you only do no, that they, if you're in? They they, do, they don't. So there's three commissioning sources for the Army. There's there's uh, OCS, Officer Candidate School. You have to be a prior service guy. You have to come from another another occupational specialty. There's ROTC, Reserve Officer Training Corps, and then there's the service academies. In this point, in this case, uh, West Point. So, so there, so you could come from one of those three commissioning sources, and then once you get commissioned, then you go to your br- your branch. So, Armor, Artillery, Aviation, Logistics, Chem Corps, whatever it is, you go to that basic course so so you may not have a bunch of exposure to combat arms type things comma however in in the three commissioning sources uh what is a, what is a, a task or a skill common to all is infantry stuff Inf- you know patrolling um troop leading procedures small unit tactics kind of stuff so you everyone gets a, a little exposure to it but i would not be i would not be confident with a uh, a finance officer or or a, or a mod one or a, you know mark zero uh, mod one uh, 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 logistics officer calling in fire certainly not not in danger close so no so th- th- I think there is a you know there's a bit of a caste system in the army there is combat arms combat support combat service support and in the combat arms there is a caste system as well. Infantry guys are the most uh, revered. Um, uh, and then, you know, sort of, and then you go down the list and you know, put maybe then armor guys, then maybe aviation guys, then uh, uh, then engineers and artillery, something like that. Um, Man, you put my so, artillery way at the bottom. That's upsetting. But, but, <laughs> but, but they're, they're at the, they're above the combat sport, combat service support. So, but, That's but, a good thing. but, but, um, but 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 you don't the the one of the reasons why they don't enjoy a more exalted position is because most guys don't have exposure to it. Yeah. For now, sure. if you have been around artillery, if you have been, if you have, or if you are calling for or receiving artillery, you will very clearly understand the value and importance of artillery. Mm-hmm. I mean, that is a a massive game changer. And and so um, so I like to think that that that. Real combat arms guys really understand the value uh, of artillery, so don't don't feel bad. Jim. <laughs> I, know. I think you're doing okay, but uh, but that's that's just the reality, right? So inf- infantry guys are um, um, they they are probably the top tier guys, right? And or at least in their own mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you you can't you can't get into um, uh, you can't get into special operations until you're a, uh, at least a first lieutenant promotable. So you have to have a couple years in. Um, um, so it's not, it's not an, special forces, is not an assessions branch. So, so if it was, everyone would want to be an SF guy and, and we would probably have a, a, a higher status, but you just can't get there, uh, from, from the word go. What made you want to become an SF guy? Well, at what point were you like, that's my next step? Yeah. So I, I had, so there were two things I had a, I had a, an, a, 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 a an emotional epiphany. So. I was really enjoying my time in the cabin. I, I told you, I always wanted, knew I wanted to be a commando. I, I wanted to do this this thing. I didn't know how I was going to do it. didn't know what that meant. Um, I just knew that it probably involved uh, living in the field and having a cool knife or something. And uh, and I knew I didn't want to be in an office. So um, so I went into the Army. I was in the cavalry. And, and I had a, an amazing time and learned a ton. But I knew – but all of my mentors were telling me, hey, this is not normal. Like, you're not going to get to do – live this kind of op tempo normally this is this is a rare thing and um and i had i'd already done all the cool stuff i'd done ntc a couple of times i'd done uh, gunneries i'd done all that stuff and i thought I, I don't know if i can keep doing this for the next 20 years because like i've kind of done it all now and um and they had canceled so they they were they were coming up with a um, a light tank um, they used to have the 82nd here at Fort Bragg used to have what's called the M551 Sheridan Armored Reconnaissance Vehicle. And it was essentially the airborne tank. And uh, and they had they were in the midst of fielding a new replacement for that. It was going to be called the Armored Gun System. 
And I was like, well, that'd be cool. I'll go do that. It'll be an airborne thing. It'll be kind of cool. I, that gets me to brag. I know brag is where they do special forces stuff. You know, I'll go there and touch the magic. Maybe some of it will rub off on me. And they, they announced uh, that they canceled the, the armored gun system. And I was like, fuck. Oh, well, there was that thing. And, uh, and, and, I, and at the same time, I was being, uh, I w- was exposed to a, a prior service special forces guy he was a prior service enlisted guy and had, had commissioned into uh, military intelligence and i was a scout platoon leader and i had a very close working relationship with this with this military intelligence guy and he was an sf guy and they had just they had just authorized the halo wings so halo wings are you know halo school has been around for a long time military freefall school but the wings were not they weren't a thing until until you know mid 90s and for those who have seen the military freefall wings they look badass yeah they're cool you know big spread wings and a dagger the sword and all that and and he wore them one day and i was like whoa what is that so i'd been hit you know gut punched with no armored gun system you can't go do this this other cool thing and and here's this sf guy who's been mentoring me and he's super switched on and all now he's wearing these cool but this cool you know uh free fall wings i was like holy shit I, I gotta get some of that so so i said let me go give it a shot so i went to go see a recruiter and uh and they gave me a little you know pamphlet of a pt pamphlet an eight-week pt program and i was like i can do this was, you know physical fitness was wasn't a big thing so I just did it and uh, and raised my hand and showed up for brag. I knew nothing about selection. I knew absolutely nothing about what what happens out here. I knew nothing about the process. I didn't know anything. The internet barely existed, and I showed up here and and got my ass kicked and and made it. Was that, it what was it what you thought it was going to be? Uh, gosh. Yes and no. So, it, so what what I thought it was going to be. So the only thing I, I don't know where I'd read it. It was a book, a, a, ex, a book excerpt or an article or something. All I knew. So uh, selection is held out at Camp McCall. Camp McCall is a little auxiliary field about thirty miles west of Fort Bragg. And all I'd heard about Camp McCall was that it was in the middle of a swamp, and uh, and they lived in tar paper shacks. You know, like roofing paper shacks. I, I don't know where I learned that from, but everyone of my age seems to know that description. And um, so that's what I thought it was going to be. And um, and so I, I thought I knew it was going to be physically demanding because they'd handed me a PT book to, to to the recruiters gave that to me. And the, in the PT book, you had to you had to fill it out. You had to put your name and rank on the front when you started it and you had to track your workouts. Mm. And you were supposed to turn this thing in when you showed up to selection. And that was proof that you were you were ready to go. And um, so. Um, I, th- I thought it was there. It was a swamp. There were tar paper shacks, and you had to be physically fit. So I showed up out there. There were no tar paper shacks. They'd been torn down, and they were now living in I guess Quonset huts. Uh, and I handed my PT book in, and the, the cadre who took it looked at it and threw it right in the trash. And I was like, "Well, that's everything I know about selection, and all of it's wrong. So I have no clue what, what's going to go on here." I do, but but my physical fitness paid off for me, and, and I made it. And and that's kind of the way it's supposed to be, right? So you're not supposed to know what selection is like. Mm-hmm. Um, but but in recent years, um, there's I mean, so selection is run by what's called SWIC, the Special Warfare Center in School, U.S. Army John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center in School. You should just go SWIC. Everybody calls it SWIC. So SWIC runs selection, and. And nobody used to talk about what selection was. If you're on the inside, you kind of knew, knew some stories. Well, then uh, um, Swick actually had a, uh, a, a, uh, a documentary filmed about selection. It was called uh, Two Weeks in Hell. And, and it, was a, uh, it was on the Discovery Channel. It's very well known. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can go online and buy it right now. And it was the cheesiest piece of crap you could ever put together. And, and it was filmed... During a, a very brief period, there was a few months at the height of the surge in Iraq and Afghanistan, 0405 time frame, where um, they had altered what selection looks like. You, it's, it has always been three weeks. There was a short time there where they made it two weeks, and that happened to be the point, the point where they filmed this, uh, this documentary. And they filmed all the worst parts, made it, made it look like it's something it completely is not. And it completely ruined the, the 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 proper image of what selection was. So I didn't know anything about it. Um, years later, they did a documentary that makes it look like uh, it's something that it isn't. 
and then and then combine that with our discussion earlier about all these retirees who just say I had the hard last hard class and they're giving it away and you're all fucked up and you're not going to make it and you're a piece of shit. So it's like, I, so in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, God Almighty, like we've got to do better than this. And and Swick, uh, you know, they have a very strong social media presence, um, but they're not going to they're not going to give away the standards, and and neither am I. The, they are right, and they should. They are right to not, not give away the standards, but they ought to be doing something to battle the misinformation. So, for example, I, I, I have, in the process of my research, I've talked to thousands of candidates, interviewed thousands of candidates, and I have had several dozen tell me that the reason that they didn't get selected was because the cadre didn't like their tattoos. This is the this is their legitimate reason. Now we you, like you. I see you 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 cringe at that, and I'm like, yeah, me too. Like we we know inherently that that is not true, but there but 64 percent of the candidates that go to selection fail. So thirty six percent get selected. Sixty four percent of the guys who go don't get selected, and they go back to their units. Right? They go they return to their units. And they are unlikely to tell their their the guys in their unit, hey, I failed because I, I didn't ruck fast enough, or I wasn't strong enough, or or I was a bit of a I was a bit of a jerk during team week. They're unlikely to say that because that that sort of you know that's on them now, right? Mm-hmm. What they're more likely to say is go back and say, I didn't get selected because the cadre didn't like my tattoos, or or I didn't have I don't have my ranger tab, or I don't have enough deployments, or tab whatever the excuse is, right? Yeah, insert insert your excuse there, and that's that is patently false. But but the two thirds of the guys that go are telling those stories when they go back to the units, and and so that is that is classic mis and disinformation. And so now now we're, we have a conflict here, Swick, who manages the image of of the of special forces and of selection is unwilling to tell the true story about selection. You can tell the story without giving away the standards. So you've got, they're unwilling to, to, to tell the story. And these guys that are out in the operational force are telling the wrong story. Like they're, it's blatantly flat out false. And so in the middle there is this misinformation, disinformation sphere. The information environment is incredibly dirty. And because that is dirty and uncertain, we are there are guys that are like just like we discussed guys are looking for information and they're getting bad information and i'm like man i'd rather they have no information than bad information but if no one's going to go going to combat the guys that are that are speaking the the falsehoods their tattoos or whatever um then we then we're doing a huge disservice and we're missing an opportunity to recruit guys that may be really good for the regiment that are just like I don't want to give it a shot because I'm not even going to get a fair shot I got I got bad I got bad ink on my arm I'm not even going to go to selection so, I'm How, not, so we missed that we missed a chance to even assess that guy yeah yeah um, having been on both sides I mean you've been a candidate going into the unknown and you've been on the other side kind of see you know you've talked to all these people interviewing and or you've interviewed all these people and you obviously you're within the special forces community. So, you know, tons of green berets. How have you seen, and and you're still involved in the training aspect of, and stuff like that, or you have been, how have you seen changes in training? Have there been major shifts in selection? I mean, you mentioned a brief change where they went from three weeks to two weeks during the surge and, and to kind of, I guess, frame this question a little bit for a long time, you know, while I was in and probably still, there was a huge push to get more special operators because there was more missions that required that kind of training skill set, whatever they needed more special operators for some of these missions. And there's a lot of people out there that believe that the training standards and stuff have been diluted or, or whatever changes are going to happen as technology and stuff improves. And as our understanding of things improve, how have you seen changes occur within like selection within maybe the Q course or, or follow on training? So, so selection itself is virtually unchanged. That, that's, that's really interesting in that it's been around for 35 years, formally. Uh, we just celebrated the 35th anniversary like last week. Um, it is essentially unchanged from when it was initially stood up. That's pretty cool that we, we kind of got it right. That's a, the Tiger team of, of guys that put it together back in the, the late 80s did a really good job. Um, it is essentially unchanged now. 
the that selection. Now, there's been a couple of minor things. So one of the one of the big differences is that we 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 always knew that selection work. We knew what it did and sort of the process. It's a it's a standard three week construct. The first week is is gate week. It's individual uh, assessments. Second week is land navigation week, and the third week is team week. And that that's remained virtually unchanged, except for that that brief stint when we had the documentary about us, which was horrible. Um, but uh, so it, we we've always known we've always followed the same construct and the standard themselves which which most people don't know maybe 20 people on on the planet know the standards uh that the, they have remained virtually unchanged uh but what but what has changed is that now as opposed to just you know 15 years ago we know why it works so uh back in 2011 uh before i retired i was stationed with the special warfare center school and selection fell under my leadership portfolio and we were going through a significant strategic reckoning process where we were we were looking to refine the training pipeline for special forces so that it met the operational needs of the operational force right and because we had done so much we were so busy fighting the wars in iraq and afghanistan that we um lost sight of what the Q course, the qualification course, the pipeline should produce. So for example, guys were, um, uh, because of the op tempo, guys were graduating the qualification course and showing up to their ODA, their their operational detachment alpha, their A team, and deploying almost right away within within a week or two of showing up to their team. Whereas the 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 pipeline model was designed for guys to show up to their graduate the qualification course, show up to their team and spend some time getting some leadership and mentorship and training from the senior guys on their team, your team sergeant and your and your and the senior MOSs. And and um and we couldn't do that because the op tempo was so high. So the operational force was demanding back to Swick saying, hey, we need these guys when they show up to our team to already be prepared to deploy. So for example, the the, the qualification course of old had no combat marksmanship in it, that, which is kind of shocking to some, but there was no combat marksmanship. So you, the idea was you show up to your, your team and your team sergeant would teach you how to shoot a pistol and how to do, how to do uh, close quarters combat. Well, now teams are deploying right away. These guys don't have time to train. The, the operational force is demanding that SWIC, hey, give these guys some combat marksmanship in the Q course. So if you add the add combat marksmanship into the Q course, you got to take something out. So the Q course changed over over the years, but selection did not change. The standards are still identical to what they were 35 years ago when it when it when it was first set up. But what has changed is that the training population has changed. People today, kids today, are different than they were 35 years ago. For sure. Um, I mean, just just the physical the physicality of kids has changed um and, and what's what's really interesting and, and what plays into this this social media disinformation um landscape is that kids today have a different relationship with risk and reward they they evaluate risk and reward differently and we like to think about it in terms of um uh the participation trophy uh, is all the, you know these kids are all participation trophy uh, era kids, and there is some truth to that. It's not not quite as, as simple as we make it out to be. But what ki- because kids today have been programmed by social media to seek immediate positive affirmation, right? This when you do a social media post, you get likes, and it's immediate, right? So you are you have trained yourself. You almost have a Pavlovian response to getting good immediate feedback, and you have a and you have a very a pathological fear of getting immediate bad feedback. So what we've done is we've trained an entire generation of people to have a different understanding of risk and reward, where they will not engage in an activity, a high risk activity, whether that risk is social shunning or physical risk. They will not engage in a risk, a high risk activity unless the reward is so high that it outweighs that. They do that risk reward, risk reward analysis. So. People are less likely to uh, throw their hat in the ring to become a special operator if they if they are less certain of the outcome, right? Mm-hmm. So now think about what I just talked about there in terms of the the discussion about tattoos. If now if I think that if I'm going to go and I have the wrong ink on my arm, I'm not going to get selected. I'm definitely not going to go. So so we we have this changing. So the standards have not changed. The pipeline is virtually the same. Or, I'm sorry, the the selections is virtually the same. 
but the training population is different. So you can't expect to have the same recruitment strategies that you always have and get the same in. You can't have, you're having different inputs. You're going to get different outputs. For you sure. have to accommodate that. So, so if SWIC is still unwilling to engage in the information environment in a meaningful way, it's one thing to do a, a post of a bunch of guys carrying something heavy, but unless you describe like why that is like what they're, what they're doing, what they're, what, 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 attribute are they are they assessing mm -hmm. like kids are just like oh fuck it i'm not i'm not gonna try I mean, that looks it, miserable it, it's miserable it's miserable it's confusing and 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 i have no idea what's going on so why risk going there with the risk reward that's the, this is all what we're talking about so the but so you can you can alter that that risk reward analysis in those kids by just giving them a little more correct information you don't have to give them all of the information you don't have to tell them the standards just give them a little more information that, that's, you know, that's what we do now. That's what you and I do. If, if, if I tell you about, hey, there's this new product, you got to go check it out. You're not, you're not just going to go buy it. You're going to go research it, right? You're going to mm -hmm. pull your phone. You're going to research it. You're going to start weighing out and getting, gathering more information and doing some risk reward analysis. I mean, hell, you can't buy a, you, you can't buy a, a product today without checking out the social credit of that product first, right? That's just the way we work now. So if we have not altered, if we have not updated, accommodated, our, the uh, a new recruiting strategy to adjust to our recruiting population. How do we expect to have good recruiting numbers? And that's the that's the same across the whole army, the or the whole military. The 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 military has been getting their ass kicked on social media uh, because because all the bad stories make the news and none of the good stories do. Yeah, you, know? so you got to highlight the good stories. You're not lying by telling the good stories. But you got to at least come at it something, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, as a digital marketing guy, that's uh, I tell I tell clients, I'm like, look, if you're not on social media, if you're not driving the conversation about your brand on social media, then somebody else is, and you're you're you at, you're at the whim of whatever they're saying about you. And if you're not yep. going in and challenging that, or you know, putting out like you said, alternative information, not alternative information, but here's the other side of the story, you know, right. then you get what you sow kind of deal. Um, yeah, it's a, today's generation is, is a more of a why generation. And I don't necessarily, I'm not mad about that necessarily, you know, because I, I don't think it's wrong for people to ask why, why am I doing this? Like, why, what is it? What's in it for me? You know, it's, right. it's really easy to be like, well, it's patriotism and you should serve your country and all. Yeah. Okay, cool. But literally at the end of the day, like patriotism and stuff doesn't feed my family. It doesn't care for the things that, why are you asking me to do this task? Why is that? Why would that be appealing to me? Um, you know, time and place, obviously for the, uh, why conversation, but I'm, you know, when you tell a whole generation of kids, like, Hey man, every one of you has a cell phone in your hand and you can seek out information constantly. You should be finding information and then you don't give them the information when they request it about something, of course, they're going to ignore it because like, what well, you know, I can find out. Uh, so I, it's a tough, it's a tough cookie, right? You know, it's a, it's a tough it, nut it, to crack. And, 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 you know, I have guys reach out to me all the time, guys in the pipeline, pr prospective candidates that want to become special forces. And they'll ask me straight up, ask me, Hey, what is the standard for this event? And I, and I know the standards. I'm one of the, one of the two dozen guys that knows the actual standards. I've signed a non-disclosure agreement. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, to give the standards, but, and I will just tell those kids, Hey, I can't tell you. And here is why I can't tell you, because this is what we are assessing. This is the, this is the process that we went through to arrive at the decision to not tell you. And that is a perfectly acceptable answer for both me and for them. Like they'll respond to that. Like, Hey, okay, no, I get it. I get, I get that. I get that reasoning. So you, you, to your point, you don't have to lie you don't have to give alternative facts. You just, have to, you just have to give an explanation because there are two sides to every story. So uh, this is the, this is the problem with, you know, censorship and, and, uh, and, and shadow banning and all that business, because we deserve as humans to make our own assessment. Like give, give, give me the information. I'll assess its value. I'll do the research. I, I, I have, I have good logic and good reasoning and I can evaluate evidence and 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 let let me make the decision. But by 100%. not telling me, you're not giving me the opportunity to 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 be part of the process. So that's just that's human nature, you know. Mm -hmm. So so that, I think there's some danger there. And and I think and we are very we are seeing that that 
the 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 crop that we have sown is poor recruiting, uh, bad attitudes about service. I mean, there are there. Uh, I saw a recent survey that most most veterans would not advise their children or their loved ones to join the service. Like, whoa. If you're in the DOD, you ought to be shitting your pants right now, knowing that that's that, that stat is out there. Like, because we guys like you and me are probably the prime recruiting source for for the for for the services. And if many of us are saying it's, that juice ain't worth the squeeze, boy, that, that you're gonna have a. If you think the recruiting problem is bad now, wait wait ten years from now, it's gonna be even worse. Yeah, my advice to people now, I mean, really, and and I guess it. it I don't know if it's changed a lot, but I tell people, I'm like, look, if you're going to go in, like, it's an awesome opportunity. You're going to learn a lot of stuff. You're going to meet a ton of people. You're going to meet people from all walks of life. You're going to learn skills that you didn't realize are how applicable they are in the real world. Um, but, you know, if you aren't, when you come up for your first reenlistment, if you don't think you're going to do 20, then get out. There's no reason to do another four and then get out because if let's say you came in at 18, now you're now you did you're up to 22 and you do another enlistment, now you're up to 26, and then you're going to start a new career. You're getting the literally the exact same benefits that as someone that only did four years. So that's my advice because I'm like, there's a lot of guys that that will stay in for a long time and put up with a lot of bullshit. And like me, you know, I hit 12 years and there was a lot of staff sergeant 0861 you know jtac forward observers in the marine corps that hit their 12 year mark and they were like that's it for me i'm done and it was because it was because of you know management issues it was because guys were constantly deploying and not getting time downtime it was hey after i've done multiple deployments you know i ask for something like whatever, you know, I I'd like for the Marine Corps to throw me a bone and the Marine Corps says, fuck you. Here's your next deployment or here's your next duty assignment that I know you don't want to go to, you know? Right. And it's like, guys see that and they're like, you know why I'm not going to put up with this. So, and they get out and I tell people it's a weird thing because your first enlistment sucks a lot of times, especially the first half. Cause a lot of it, you're a junior guy, you're training, you're in all these schools. So the first half of it is just getting told, you know, getting beat. Then you yeah. get to your unit and you get beat some more. The second enlistment is better than the first a hundred percent because now you're probably an NCO or coming up to be an NCO and you get to start having a little bit of say of what's going on in your life. But if you hit that four year mark and you're just absolutely miserable and you don't, you think you might do one other enlistment, I, I wouldn't advise someone to stay in. And that's probably, again, that's probably something the DOD doesn't want to hear, but again, what's in it for me. It's nice to be like, yeah, it's patriotic and stuff like that. But when I come home from the field, from being in the field for two weeks and it's 80 fucking degrees plus every day. And then I get back to my barracks on camp Pendleton and it has no air conditioning because ocean breeze, which doesn't is non-existent. Okay. So now I get to come back to the barracks and swelter for in my room and sweat in an 80 degree room, you know, when I should be relaxing and enjoying some downtime m minus the fact that, Oh, okay. Now there's mold on the wall as well. Or there's these issues like, you got to give something back to the guys that, you know, the service members. Yeah, and, don't, and, don't, 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 I would say, don't piss down my back and tell me it's raining. And these, so and I these just, issues I'll are, put up with a lot. and these issues are being shared on social media. There's so many accounts that'll show like, Hey, there's undercooked yeah. chicken. They're feeding raw food in the child. I remember, and people, these aren't, these, these aren't one-off stories. You know, when you see these, like there's issues with the food or, and don't get me wrong, the cooks and stuff do uh, most of the time they do a great job. They're fantastic people. A lot of the times the issues I've seen is with the, on the, the contractors that work with the actual cooks, the military guys usually are really good, but it's like, I mean, I've seen people drop food on the ground, pick it up and then offer it to me like a worker at a chow hall. And I'm like, no dude, I don't want that. Like, are you kidding me? Right. But this, this this is the stuff that's keeping people from reenlisting, and also it's spreading that discontent online. Because if I'm a 18 year old kid, senior in high school, and I'm like, man, I want to join the Marines, but then I look at a video and it shows like, hey, we just got back from the field and our our rooms are covered in mold, or hey, this is uh, no, no chow or whatever the issue is, then I'm gonna be like, man, do I really want to do that? Because it's already right. you're already giving up a lot just to join. You know, that's um, you know, you're giving up your freedom basically, because you are giving the government the right to tell you what to do at all, you know, 24 seven for the next four years, maybe right. eight years. If you get, 
you know, like recalled or whatever. Well, the, the, the guys, the guys that control the culture, they control the narrative, they control the policy. They, they, they make the commands, what the, the units, what they are, are all lifers. Right. So therefore that must be the only way you can join the military is to be a lifer. So if you're not a lifer, then you're less than I, I'm of the mind. You tell me if you're the same way, I, I don't have any problem with a kid joining solely for the benefits. He wants to come in. Yeah. He wants to get his GI bill. He wants to do student loan repayment. He wants to, he wants to just get a skill set, and then he wants to cut sling load and get out. I'm like, Hey man, awesome. Do it. Mm-hmm. They, get, take the four year contract. Take the five. If you, if you're just coming in for the bonus, cool, get your bonus. We're going to use you while you're here. You're going to use us and then move on. And imagine the change in attitudes you'd see of seniors if we started having that sort of discussion. Uh, that that it, it is it is not only acceptable, for many guys, it's preferable that they only come in for one tour. Let them come in. Let him, well, A guy comes in for four years. He gets a little bit of discipline. He becomes a, becomes an alumni of us. He, he's now a supporter of us. We treat him like a human being. We give him his benefits, and he moves on. What is wrong with that exchange? Absolutely nothing. And if we if we started to embrace that mentality, guys would start to have a different uh, 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 expectation of their four years. They'd be like, "This we had an exchange, and I'm moving on. I got exactly out of it what I wanted. They got exactly out of it what they wanted, and everybody wins. Now we're moving on. But but because the narrative and the culture is controlled by lifers like me, anything that you my path is the only righteous path. Therefore, if you don't follow my path, you're unrighteous. Mm-hmm. And, and, and in that is a, is a real problem. So there's nothing wrong with the guy doing a one, one pump and getting out. Absolutely nothing at all. We need lots of E4s and below. I mean, that's the majority, right? That's the majority of the military is, yeah. that, is that crowd. It's just, uh, yeah, I, again, I, I think people, I think it's an opportunity still. I don't think I would, uh, if, my, if my son wanted to join, I don't think I would talk him out of it or anything. I wouldn't push him into it. I think I'm fully of the belief that the military is something that you have to want, you know, and if you don't want it and you go and if you're doing it because of some other reasons or someone else is telling you you should join, or you think you owe something, you know, or whatever, but you don't really want to do it, but you're doing it because you feel like you need to, you may not have the best time. I felt like I knew what I was getting into when I joined just because I'm pseudo military family. I mean, my, like I said, my dad, my grandparents, you know, they were all military and stuff like that. So I kind of understood what I was getting to, not to the full extent, because you never know until you're there. But right. yeah, I don't know. It's 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 one of those things where I, it is troubling that a lot of veterans don't want their kids to join, but it's also the result of what we've seen. You know, people people disagree with some of the decisions that are happening. Politics are leaking into the military sphere more than ever before. Um, we went from organizations where the individual doesn't matter. The individual, your individual characteristics don't matter. Like it's one team, one fight kind of deal to where now we have to highlight every individual aspect that every person has, you know, I'm, I'm waiting on left-handed awareness month because there's like 5,000 people killed every year using right-handed products that are left-handed. And as a left-handed person, you know, I feel like people need to know about that. You know what I'm saying? But it's that kind of like thing where, well, this group gets a, a month or a day or a fucking whatever. Well, why doesn't this group? And that's the exact opposite of what the military is supposed to be. It's supposed to be, forget all those external factors, forget all the shit that you can't change. We're bringing you all here. We're starting you from the same spot and, and it's on you. It's a meritocracy. Come in here and and thrive and be great. And that's the the beauty of special forces assessment and selection. It is the ultimate meritocracy. And so it, it attracts a certain type of person that wants to be judged on their own merit. And, and so that's why that narrative about he didn't get slept because of his tattoos is so damaging because it's absolutely not true. Getting selected is 100% about your performance. That's it. It doesn't matter what your background is. Doesn't matter if you were a low, just doesn't matter if you were a water purification specialist or if you came from the 75th Ranger Regiment, you're getting evaluated on the exact same standards. And, and, and those standards have not changed ever. And mm-hmm. so if, if we could get that message out, imagine how powerful that'd be. You would be attracting the guys that you wanted for the reasons that you wanted to, because they wanted to be assessed. It's, it is special forces assessment and selection. 
we are going to assess you. Like, and a lot of guys, they want to be measured. Like, I, I want to be amongst the best. Measure me. Where do I go to do that? You come to Camp McCall to do that. And so the my book, Rock Upper Shelf, is about that process. So the, the and 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 I know I know that that story is resonating with guys because they're emailing me and telling me like I'm gonna go give this a shot. I I didn't think it was possible. Now I think it's possible, and that's really um, encouraging, right? Because if you if you just stayed on social media, you'd think there's two classes of people in the military. There's the absolute tip of the spear jumping off the ramp, you know, free fall in the night, in the night with lasers on their guns and throwing flashbangs. And then there's the disgruntled guys living in the, in the, uh, uh, in the mold soaked barracks, right? That's all there is. So it, you're either one or the other. And if you don't think you can be the tip of the spear, then your, your lot in life is just to, just to sit in the mold and swelter. And, and that's just not true the, the there is so much greatness in the service. And, and this thing about that, it is service. You are serving, right? So what does that service look like? For everybody, it's different, right? For some guys, it's tip of the spear stuff. For some guys, it's just, I go, I go to the motor pools on Monday. On, you know, on Tuesdays, I do, I do my, my personnel packets. And, you know, whatever, whatever that life is, there's nothing wrong with that. You, not everybody can or has to be a Green Beret, right? Not everybody has to be a special operator. But for those that want to be a special operator, want to be a Green Beret, there is a pathway, it is righteous, and it is attainable. And that's what the book is about, is this is what that pathway looks like. So the response has been really good on that. And that's very encouraging, because what it tells me is that there, there are still, even though we're in a recruiting crisis, there's still lots of people out there that want to be part of something bigger than themselves. They want to serve, they, they, they want to do this thing, and, and, and they're willing to risk the ire of the social media to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, that's a really encouraging thing. I mean, it gives me hope, you know, it gives me hope for the future. How much I, the, I know that I'm not in the last hard class. How much of this recruiting crisis do you think is owed to that there, there's no wars? You know, there's a lot of people that join specifically because they're like, hey, I want to join. And, you know, as a young kid, this is one of those life, I guess, opportunities. You see people go and they, you, see, you know, the movies and everything makes it look glamorous. So they want to go get their war on and stuff mm -hmm. and now there's no war so why would i even go and just play it's like going and practicing for football every day but never getting to play the game right yeah i think there's there's definitely a part of that that's a that's a big part but but you know do do we want guys that are that are that are joined just to go kill people well i didn't say necessarily go kill people no no i know i know you did but be, be, be that obviously listen that's war though yeah yeah we're talking about a very nuanced subject. So whenever you talk about something that's hyper nuanced, it's always a beneficial to take a take a, a an extreme position and then examine it from that position. So what is the extreme position of of, of that? Is uh, guys want to go kill people? I, we get that's extreme, but do do we necessarily need a bunch of guys that have to go to war in order to feel like they serve? You know, I, maybe I'm okay with less of those guys coming in, but that's certainly part of the part of the problem. But I think the sort of the bigger point is is how do we then redefine what is service for those guys? What, what then becomes palatable? What, what's acceptable? You know, mm -hmm. how, how much can we get out of them? And the cool thing about being a green Beret, So I, I think now, you know, the, the, the GWAT, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan represented a departure from what green berets really are meant to do. Right. The, so those sexy direct action missions, kicking indoors, shooting people in the face, that is not the norm. And frankly, that is a waste of a Green Beret's efforts because I can train kind of pretty much anybody to do that stuff. I can get a, I can get a, I can get a, a troop of monkeys and, and train them up to, to do uh, ground combat. I'm not, I'm not denigrating monkeys or ground combat, but, but <laughs> it's, uh, but, but what Green Berets would do, we're force multipliers, right? You take, take a 12 man ODA and send them into the hinterland to let them, let them recruit a band of guerrillas and in several months they will take 500 farmers and turn them into a standing army. Like that's not a wartime. That's not a peacetime. I'm sorry. That's not a, just a wartime mission. That is a mission that we do 24, seven, 365, regardless of what's going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And, and, that, and that's a super challenging mission that takes the best and the brightest trained to the absolute sharpest edge possible. That mission still exists, even though Iraq and Afghanistan are virtually over. So that's an exciting time to say, I want to be a Green Beret, because 
we, we are returning to the golden era of special forces where, so I, I, I describe it like this. Iraq and Afghanistan were not the norm. You would, you would leave the wire on a patrol in Iraq and Afghanistan, and what did you have overhead? You had gunships and, and a QRF and an infantry platoon ready to pull your ass out of the sling. You had ISR soak like, like for days. Like, so those missions, while they were challenging, were in many ways easy because you had all these assets. You sort of you had every advantage possible. Well, now you're going to see teams deploying to locations where they don't have that. They don't have any ISR. The, the QRF is the other half of the team that's back at the base. And so you've really got to have your shit wired tight mm -hmm. now. Like you've got to be really switched on. You, you have to have a super reliable teammates. So you, everyone's got to be trained really well. They have to be assessed really well. Like everyone, everything's got to be, uh, you know, a finely tuned machine. And that's, that's like, that's the cool stuff. That's, that's the high performance stuff that, that really drives uh, a certain type of guy, a green beret. And we, so we are, you are now entering back into that world now where, where you're going to deploy to a country and you're, you'll, your, your ODA will be the only team in country. The closest American will be the mill group commander at the embassy 500 miles away. And he ain't coming to pull your ass out of the mix. So you better have your shit squared away. You better have your, your, all your contingencies, all your branches and sequels, your evasion plan of action. You better have that stuff wired tight. That's exciting shit. Like, that's cool. Like, holy hell, that's what I got into this for. Now your language and your culture has to, is, has to be really wired tight. Like, like you can't, you don't have interpreters now. You, because there's no contracting money for it. So you got to learn the language yourself. I grew up in seventh group in, in Latin America and, and the, the quality of my life was wholly dependent on how well I spoke Spanish because I wasn't, I didn't have an interpreter. And, and, and that's the cool shit that I joined the military to do. That's what I wanted to do. That's my version of service, right? I want to do the jumping out of airplanes and the shooting stuff and, and blowing up stuff. But I also want to do the language and culture. I also, want, I also want to do how to build rapport, how to understand human dynamics, how to, how to build instinct. I want to be able to, I want to be, I want someone to train me so that when I walk into a room, I can immediately start identifying who the power brokers are, who's in charge, who do I have to influence? Man, that, that to me is the challenge. And we're getting ready to go back into that era now. Mm -hmm. And man, so if that's your thing, Brother, you are sitting on the edge of a of a great twenty year career or a four a four year pump. I think a lot of people forgot that that's what was going on, and that was a standard kind of mission for Green Berets. Like, and and I mean, like general public and stuff until that um, attack in Niger happened, like five years ago or so. And and you know, right. multiple people were killed there, and people were like, "Wait, we're in Africa? You know, like what's going on?" Right. And it's like, yeah, dude, like there's people all over the like place. We're everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's like one of those things. So. It's um, I think you're right. I that is the traditional Green Beret mission, you know. As I was, I guess, learned growing up and and being around like army guys and stuff, I kind of knew, you know, that whole village stability operations and stuff like that was kind of yeah. their bread and butter. You know, as you when you deployed as a Green Beret, so you were you were a pre GWAT guy, and then you also deployed, you know, post GWAT, obviously as a Green Beret. What did your missions look like? Were were there because like Marsoc will do, they have a couple when they send a team over from my, from me interviewing people, I wasn't with Marsoc, but they have multiple missions. One will be either going over as a VSP, the v village stability uh, platform where they're going through and, you know, doing the advise and assist and stuff like that. Or they're going as a team that's going to go and just do raids, you know, do hits night after night and stuff yeah. like that. Is it similar for the green berets or were they, uh, you know, focused on one over the other. It, it, you know, it depends on when you deployed. So I was actually a a a mid GWAT guy. So I was I was I was a detachment commander for deployed on nine eleven. I was in mm. in the jungles in Latin America went on the day of nine eleven. Wow. And so uh, so when we redeployed from Latin America for that deployment, you know, when we left the country in uh, the summer of two thousand and one, uh, it was a very different environment than when I than when we returned. In October of, of uh, 2001, uh, I, I remember we were coming. We, we had actually flown commercial uh, on this mission and we had hand carried our comsec. We had all of our satcom uh, com stuff and had hand carried our comsec. And there was in the, it was all locked up. And if you didn't have a clearance, you weren't allowed to look at the comsec. And we came back, we came back through uh, customs and immigration in uh, Miami. When we left, it was kind of wide open. You know, TSA wasn't a thing. And we came back and it was a hyper alert security environment. 
And we had like a Mexican standoff in the in the airport in Miami with customs and security officials that wanted to look inside of her bag. And we were like, no, you're not. Like, you're not authorized to see this. And we like, we had a, a tense three-hour standoff in the airport there where finally uh, cooler heads prevailed and somebody caught uh, the head of security there and called back to Fort Bragg to talk to our operations officer and had it all sorted out. But man, it was pretty tense. So so I was post and pre. So it depends on what, what year you're talking about. So right after 9-11, um, it was, uh, you know, the initial invasion of Afghanistan was classic unconventional warfare. For sure. I mean, we sent a couple of teams and within a couple of months, they linked up with the Northern Alliance and essentially toppled the Taliban. Like, that was a, an ama- a, a case study in unconventional warfare. Not everything was perfect, but it was pretty damn good. Uh, and, and it sort of validated our the training pipeline of what the qualification course used to look like. So it, it worked. But, but you, you know, you once I don't know that we had a plan to be so successful. We were not prepared for catastrophic success. And now what, what do we do next? Well, we got to transition. We got to transition out of this UW campaign into a into something else. We we don't know what it's going to be. So let's bring in a conventional guy. So now you have now your metrics of success and performance are t- entirely different. So now you're bringing in guy. You're bringing in more units. You got to have missions for them. So now they they do the standard security stuff. So now what do you what is what is SF guys transition to? We'll do kill capture missions because that's that's just kind of what we we're able to do and no, nobody else can do that. So we'll start doing that. So we, we you know, immediately following Af- uh, uh, the invasion of Afghanistan, it's UW, it's beautiful, but then we quickly defeat the Taliban. We tra- start doing something else. And now we just become like a, like a mini JSOC. Now we're just kill capture teams doing high value targets. Um, now think about that. That's in Afghanistan. Think about Iraq, Iraq. There is no UW mission. There is no unconventional warfare stuff. It's just ground combat, and it's an entirely different environment. And and what is the objective? Topple the Ba'athist party, debathification of the of the Saddam regime, and capture Saddam. Okay, what does that look like? It's certainly very different than Afghanistan. Is that a, a mission that's great for Green Berets? If I'm not if I'm not training an indigenous fighting force, you're kind of wasting me. I can send an infantry squad and get about as much firepower out of them. And I and I I don't need language and culture experts. I don't need a more mature force. So so I, I've seen everything from the old school pre GWAT like show up in a in a country and you're the only guys to you're one of you know, twelve ODAs and you're just racked and stacked on kill capture raids all night. You you may you have a small security presence during the day, maybe some uh, some presence patrols, but it's entirely different. So so your experience is based on it could it could literally be from one deployment to the next could be very very different. So I, I had all of that. I had the I had the the low visibility uh, slow burn stuff all the way up to the kill capture stuff. And you have to think about it pre nine eleven. If you were a tip of the spear special operator. You might do one cool raid your whole life, right? That, mm-hmm. And you made a career on that. Well, then there were there were it was not uncommon during the the height of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan for a, a, for a task force to run fifty missions in a night. So a guy who previously could make his entire career on one mission is now getting in one deployment one hundred and fifty raids, like a completely different experience. So. We started to obviously that appeals to a different person, right? So we recruited a whole generation of guys that wanted to do that kill capture missions, and there was plenty of those missions to go around. Iraq and Afghanistan start winding down. Our missions starting to starting to morph back to what we what we were previously. Have we adjusted our recruitment expectations for that? I don't know that we have. I think there's still a group of guys that are coming in thinking they're going to get to do daily kill capture missions. And that's the, the reality of it is, is that those that, that's not the real mission yet anymore. And Green Berets are, are you're a, if I, I always say if you're if you are using a Green Beret for those missions, you're wasting his talents. Yeah, that, that's that a Ranger a, mission. That is a high for yeah, that's a Ranger mission or or just a, a, a standard light infantry mission. You mm-hmm. don't even have to send Rangers for that. Just send a, an infantry unit. You could send an M people to him for crying out loud. You don't have to send these highly skilled, incredibly trained. Um, super unique and capable units to do that. You're wasting that talent. Send us where it's really hard to do the really hard missions, and and we're cause, because we're the only guy that can do that. We're the only Department of Defense force that is specifically 
recruited, assessed, trained, manned, and equipped to do unconventional warfare. We're it. So if you if you got me doing kill capture, you're wasting my talent. How does the army's like newer, I guess not so new now, advise and assist brigades fall into this or battalions? Yeah, the the S Fabs. So the S Fabs were designed. Yeah, the security force assistance brigades. They were designed. So so what you what you what had what what see what had happened was is that uh, we were so green berets were so busy doing the kill capture stuff that we didn't have the capacity to do the advise and assist stuff. So we created this the security force assistance brigades. Yes, Brad. And before that, we had the we had the Met. In, in, in Iraq, we had we had met. So we we built these these other structures to do to do that advise and assist mission because that, that's so critical. And we created these these formations to do that, but they didn't go through the same vetting. Excuse me, for lack of a better term, that SF guys did go through. They weren't re- specifically recruited, assessed, selected, man trained, and equipped. The, I don't think that they're bad at their mission, but I don't think that they are as well suited as they want to be i mean look look at what they are they have all the trappings of a special operations unit they have a selection it's like a one week long kind of a a walk in the park they have a special tab it's part of their part of their their unit patch they have a special beret it's brown actually the first iteration of the of the s fab beret was a color of green not it's not it wasn't the green beret green but it was i heard there was a lot like, of pushback about that there may have been people there did may, not like that, the, that people didn't like that they worked the uh, sf into their s fab also yeah <laughs> they're absolutely. like what, what are we doing here you guys are trying to like and, yeah it, it, so it was it's very clear they were they wanted to there was the need for an advise and assist unit and they and they wanted to they wanted it to have the same sort of wasta as an s as a special forces unit they went so far as giving it a, a like name and a like unit a like patch and a like beret but it's not the same uh, I, I would not feel confident for deploying an s fab unit into a politically unstable or austere non-permissive environment the way that i would a green beret team because they're different people they're trained to do different yeah. things so our, well our, our serve a real purpose are green berets now competing with the s fabs for missions or are they just are they looked at on is there like a scale like this type of this type of advise and assist mission is going to go for green berets but this type is better suited for our s fabs is it is it broken yeah. down or are they competing I, I, i'll tell you that uh Brother, it's a good time to be in the advise and assist business because there's way more business than there is people to do it. So the, I, I don't know that I, I think they, you know, they, they might be um, they might be available for the same missions. I wouldn't say they compete for them um, because there are you, you have the when a Green Beret unit deploys, they are self-sustaining, self-sustaining in regards to day to day operations and preparing for the mission and running POIs and, and all that business. And SFAB is less so 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 there are missions that there are advise and assist missions that only green brace can do by the nature of that mission whether because it's remote or the nature of the training whatever it is um and there are advise and assist missions that are i i don't want to i don't want to say easy enough but they are they are uh uh, i mean that's uh, that's that's enough i think that's a fair because it's like less logistically taxing less like foreign language understand you know like less risk involved so definitely easier you know? yeah sure so 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 i i think it becomes it becomes obvious the same way that if you were examining a mission for a steel team or a green beret team you know is there a large maritime component to it yeah okay well then that probably ought to go to a steel team right that's a, it becomes sort of obvious yeah so when i'm looking at advise and assist missions is there a large component where the the team is, is physically isolated you know are they are they at risk for for um uh, for becoming isolated personnel. Okay, that's a mission that I would send a Green Beret team to that I would be less comfortable sending a, an SBAB unit to. So I don't think of it in terms of of uh, of, uh, of competition, just what's more appropriate for that unit, right? Has, has SFAB become a recruiting tool for SF? No, it's it's actually, a, I think it's a little bit of competition. So think about it. It, you you have to be a little bit more senior, like even more. So, so you can't go special forces until you're at least 20 <laughs> for the for selection. It'd be 21 by the time I graduate the Q course. And you have to be of a certain rank. Um, 
that, but that's that standard is is a little bit lower than it is to go to an SFAB. I think for an SFAB, you have to be at least be an NCO. So, mm. I, what I think the SFAB ends up doing is drawing off some guys that want to do something different, special, but maybe don't want to have their ass handed to them for three weeks out of Camp McCall. Mm. Maybe they're okay with just going to this one week selection and having a little bit of specialness, and then maybe that's maybe that's that quenches the thirst enough. And for there's sure. nothing wrong with that, right? Yeah. Everyone serves differently. I, I have no problem. And with I'm that. sure they get to do some awesome stuff. You know, I oh, bet yeah. there's some I mean, awesome you, opportunities. You get to do way more cool stuff than you would if you just, than just motor pool Monday. Right. So it, 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 it fills a unique niche and, and you have to understand it and cool. Let, I say, go for it. Like it's a cool mission go for it. Um, but, it, and, but it, it's, it is also, it's not a career. It's an assignment. You go do that assignment and you come back to the, to the regular army. Yeah. So, uh, whereas a green Bray, like that's your green Bray for life now. Um, that's so, one of the so, things like Anglico and the Marine Corps is, is similar where that's not a, there's, but there's no like selection or anything for Anglico. You get assigned to that unit. It just happens that it's such a small unit and the expectations are really high that it's self, like they do a really good job of bringing people up to speed of where they need to be or moving them to the S3 or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, there, there's an expectation of performance for Anglico. You, you know, when you get an Anglico, assigned to your unit and he's that guy's around that son of a bitch can call for fire anywhere any way anyhow like that's it you could be there's an expectation of performance there that 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 creates its own selection so to speak hear that anglico guys this is a green beret talking telling you you should be proud of that right the same listen the same way listen being a rigger a rigger is not sexy like it's not a high a high profile job but there's an expectation of performance for my riggers. If I'm a free fall guy and I have a, I have a, an issue with my shoot and I call the rigger over to take a look at it, that son of a bitch better be able to fix it or he's gone. Right. Yeah. I don't need that guy. So, so, you know, the, the, you, you don't have to be a special operator to be a high performer or have high intrinsic motivation going back to earlier conversation and, and high expectations for performance. That's what good soldiers, airmen, Marines, and sailors do is they have high, high standards of performance and high personal expectations and good units support those people. And they create cultures of high performing organizations. This is not, this is not new stuff. This is not brain surgery. This is some of the most well-documented psychological phenomena in existence we know these things without a doubt the problem is is instituting that in the military where our, we have a transient culture every two years officers move every three to four years ncos move that's why unit cultures change if we could keep guys together like we do in special operations units you build more cohesive cultures it's it's obvious stuff this is not uh this is not unknown uh you know, black magic here is that is that something that's always been that the, the three it's, it's pretty well known. Like, Hey, every three years you're going to a different unit or a different base. I was told, or I kind of read, or maybe somewhere along the line, I would, I read something that said that the reason behind that is they don't want this like homesteading kind of attitude. And, it, and people, I guess there, at some point there was people like doing negative things like building these negative like connections you know almost like almost little mini mafias within the military because sure. they were never leaving they were staying in one area and they were building up like you know whatever it, it was that has it always been like that the the moving when you, since you've been in or was that something you've yeah, seen change? it has well, well br brother let me introduce you to the airborne mafia here at Fort bragg right like it's a well-known you know, I don't want to say it's a secret society. It's not the Illuminati or anything, but, but, you know, once you get kissed into the organization, you're sort of a, you know, you're an airborne guy. Uh, it's it, so I, I actually think that the, that the, that the, the process of moving guys around can have some benefit, particularly, particularly for officers. And, and I didn't really realize this till my first team sergeant told me this, but my very first team sergeant was obviously a senior green beret, been in the community for 15 years or something like that. He was an old school green beret guy just an amazing non-commissioned officer and and his expectation that he he count when I showed up to my unit he counseled me right like I'm coming in I don't know shit from Shinola he counseled me and he said captain here is the expectation for you you guys only come in for 2 years and you're going to hear a bunch of pushback from the guys in the in the unit all the team guys they're tired of seeing officers come in and ride them hard because they only got two years to go. These team guys got to stay on the team eight to ten years. They're like they're tired. And he said, "Don't ever let them dissuade you. 
your job because you're only here for two years is to keep the afterburner on. You are you need to exist to push innovation in this team. You got to push innovation in 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 our culture, in our tactics, everything. Like you, we need you pushing the unit. And and he and he said, and my job is to balance that out. And in that conflict there between you pushing and me pulling, we shall reach a a high performing homeostasis. And I was like. God damn, brother, that's some sophisticated shit right there you just laid on me. And like, so immediately I was like blown away by, okay, like there, there's a system. So so I, I think there's a lot of merit to that argument that officers are supposed to be moved around because we are there to push innovation, right? It's Now, the negative of that is that's what we call the good idea fairy, right? Yeah, and I was going to bring theory that up. Kills units, kills guys, absolutely. So you need strong NCOs to balance that out. You need a strong NCO who's, who's who is, is capable and and is okay with pulling the officer aside and saying, "Hey, brother, let, let's let's talk about this." At the at an ODA, it's your team sergeant. At a company, it's your sergeant major. At a battalion, it's your command sergeant major. Like you, you need that's why you need strong NCOs. And special operations is an NCO driven organization. Yeah. So so because it's an NCO driven organization, you need particularly strong officers to counterbalance that. Otherwise, you'll just get that those negative connections and that and the stagnation and all that business. So so I, I think. So in my, it's always been that way in my understanding. And I understand too, I did 16 years here at Fort Bragg. I've only ever been in three units my entire 20 year career. Mm. So I, I, I recognize the value in me being the, 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 the afterburner, but I also, I absolutely demand that my NCOs act as the, as the brakes for that. And, and units that units that do that, are good units. It's immediately apparent. And units that don't do that, they're 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 not good units. And it, everyone knows it. Those are the units that fester and and guys complain about go and, and leave. So and I had guys competing to come to our team. My team sergeant and I had guys competing to be in our team because we were appropriately op tempoed. We had the governor just right, and 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 it, and it worked. Yeah, it's got to be a good. Uh... It's got to be a good working relationship between the, you know, team leader, team chief. You know, I've met a lot of staff NCOs that won't push back against some really bad ideas. You know, they're like, well, the officer said so. And I'm like, that's not it. That's not it, man. That shit stopped once right. you were a sergeant, man. Like when you're an E6 and above in the Marine Corps, at least like your job is to stop you know, officers a lot of times from doing something dumb and it's not their fault. You know, you don't know what you don't know. They don't know. Yeah. They don't know. Yeah. You've been in the job. If you're a staff sergeant, you've been doing the job for at least one enlistment, if not two. And you're talking to an officer that's on his first, you know, four years. He just doesn't have the experience. That's not his fault. Uh, and if you let him go down these weird paths or do something dumb, then you know, that's, that's a failure on you as much as it is on him because you're there to be the backstop to not only make sure you, it's not even, it's not even the make sure he makes good decisions. It's to protect your guys as well, you know, from bad decisions. I've had bad leaders where they make all these like amazing training op, you know, opportunities and these crazy like events that we're going to go do, but then they don't partake, you know, because they have a meeting they got to go to, or they're supervising right. it or whatever, you know, and you have guys that aren't like that, that are out there right there with you, sweating it out and understand what you're going through. Um, so yeah, it's and, a weird think, balance. You I know? think good, I think good senior NCOs are the ones that can, that can demonstrate to their junior NCOs how, how to, how to, Rein that that officer in with some tact, right? You can't sure. walk on a fucking dumbass lieutenant, right? It's got to be, <laughs> hey, LT, have you have you thought about this, or 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 I, or I wonder. So the way I've always approached it, and I, I teach executive leadership and uh, and critical critical thinking and policy analysis and all that stuff. And one of the most effective tools when you're dealing with a with a potentially obstinate uh, client is a sense of wonderment. And so what, what does that look like? So instead of saying, hey, you're doing this thing wrong and here's why, you say, I wonder what it would look like if we did this. Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're giving that obstinate officer, the guy who's constantly pushing, an opportunity to, you, you're giving him a, sort of an, an out with honor and you're teaching him, right? Because your job is you don't want to have to have that lesson again. You want to teach that that young guy, here is, hey, appreciate your, your, your vim and vigor. Here's a little bit of common sense applied to that. Here's how that works in reality, right? 
here here is doctrine and here is tactics and in the middle shall be operations and and so your job is to teach teach that officer but then also teach the other non-commissioned officers and junior guys how to interact with that officer in an appropriate way you can't just call him a dumbass all the time and you can't just say yes all the time there has to be a happy medium there and and good senior ncos are the guys that can do that and and i've been incredibly blessed that all of my senior senior ncos have always been have absolutely embodied that it, I, my 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 first tank platoon sergeant was a big fat slacker and he was an amazing platoon sergeant he taught me so much my 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 ODA team sergeant was a PT god. I mean, that guy could fizz all day long. We'd do 30 minutes of abs every day just because we had to. And th those two are diametrically opposed, and they were both amazing NCOs and taught me equally valuable lessons. And and I was fortunate enough b because I think, you know, early on in my career, when I was just, I was so busy training that I didn't have time to be an idiot, um, that I sort of understood the value of their perspectives and was able to, to um, inculcate that into my, into my being. And to this day, I'm still, I am like, I, I am wide open for criticism. I tell me what I'm doing wrong. Like I, I don't take offense. Like if I write something and it's, a, and it's poorly written and someone says, Hey, you, here's a better way to write that. I'm like, yes, sir. I love that. I'm going to do that. If, if I'm, if I'm, you know, trying to build something in the garage and my dad comes over and says, here's a better way to do it. I'm like, yeah, awesome. I'm going to do it that way now. That's the best way to do it. That's the way I'm doing it. Like I have no ego in, in that stuff. Now I, I have a massive ego cause I'm a green beret, but I, I don't have ego when it comes to those sorts of things. So because I, I've sort of, I have, I have learned the value of that because my senior NCOs and my, and, and my, my commanders and officers above me have always sort of showed the value in that, in that process. And, and, and what, what, what that describes, that doesn't make me like some sort of superhuman that this makes me a good person. What makes good green berets? Good green berets are made from good soldiers. Good soldiers are made from good people. Good people are made from good citizens. Like that's what it takes, right? So raise your kids to be good people and they'll become good green berets or they'll become good doctors or good lawyers or good pilots or whatever it is. So this is that, that what I've just described is not special operations 101 or, or, or even 401. What I've described is human dynamics. That is the most basic principles. Knowledge of self, that's the, the foundations. Knowledge of self, who am I as a person? Knowledge of others, who are you as a person and how do we interact? And then the third level of human dynamics is how do others see me? So how do I see myself? How do I see you? How do others see me? And that's sort of that. Now you're now you're you sort of align your chakras and your chi flows and, and your third eye opens up and you start to become like a, you know, a yogi, a yogi master. But that is that is enlightenment. And that's so we should all seek to get there because that makes us better people. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. So I want to pose a question. I don't think I've asked. I've had a few army folks on. I don't know if I've asked this before, but in a day, in the age of the internet, of YouTube, and, you know, just a massive amount of information that we have, do you think that the requirement to have a college degree to become an officer is outdated? Because we're leaning on 25, only 25% of the U.S. public goes to college. So you're leaning on a 25% um, portion of the group of which not many are even qualified from there to to lead this officer corps and they're all coming from the same kind of thought factories and i, and I don't mean that as in like oh they're you know teaching on communism and they're woke and all that. i mean they're taught to read text write papers and do that kind of thing is there a benefit to possibly making or returning to a direct commission kind of program for and this for like like you're talking about these highly skilled NCO staff NCOs that we see are above the rest, giving them an opportunity to go, Hey man, I think you'd be a good officer. The only requirement is you still have to go through OCS. You know, the, we wouldn't waive right. that. You'd still have to go through the officer training, but the requirement to get a college degree be gone. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So you're, you're asking the right guy. I don't know if you knew this or not, but my, my last job before I retired, I was the director of education for Army Special Operations. So my job was to stand up degree programs for, for Special Forces NCOs. So um, 
like I was the college guy and my doctorate is in education, I have an EDD in education leadership with a concentration in, in the post-secondary and higher. So like, like education's like my profession, my professional profession. Um, and um, so I, you will, you have a hard time finding someone who values an education more than I do. And I fully recognize that, that I was not a great student until I got to my master's program. Uh, I was, Fully an operational guy. So I think education is uh, there. There are two things that will save the world: family and education. Intact families. You, you, my kids will never be homeless, and I will never be homeless because I won't let them be homeless, and they won't let me be homeless. We have an intact family and education. Not necessarily a college degree, but an education. So I, I recognize the value there. But let's let me put on my my tinfoil hat, my conspiracy theorist hat, and say that the 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 long slow march of Marxism and communism and socialism through the institutions has completely captured higher education. So if I was developing a a a adaptable and resilient officer corps, would it be wise of me to send them all through Marxist institutions of higher education in order to get in order to get commissioned? Probably not, right? So, but I, I also don't think that that every kid that graduates from college is a is a socialist Marxist. So, so we have to recognize that. So, the, that's the long answer to your short question. The shorter answer is is I don't think uh, that a college degree should be required. A college degree is not a panacea. It does not solve all of your problems, right? No. Uh, it it it's a it's another certification uh, avenue of certification. Hey, this guy got his college degree, and and a college degree um, in uh, in uh, uh, computer science is very different than a college degree in political science, or engineering, or mm -hmm. English. Right. So, in what way are any of those uh, is that any in any way standardized? Right. So I don't think I think there's a ton of value in in the idea. That we ought to have a, a an alternate commissioning source that recognizes experience. Now, many would argue that that's what the Warren Officer Corps is for, right? That's that's the thing that balances the two out. Nah. Warren Officer Corps has turned into a more technical. It, it's a it's a technical expertise now. So I don't know that that quite fits the bill. So I, I and, and you know and obviously you see this in senior NCOs too, where. The, the word is, you know, you're not going to make E8 unless you've got at least a bachelor's degree. So we're we're we are we are grafting on this this college degree requirement where it shouldn't exist at all. Uh, I, some of the best non-commissioned officers I've known are uh, are have a high school diploma and that's it, right? They're just they're just you don't have to be you don't have to have a degree to be wicked wicked smart. So I um but and I also know tons of guys uh, that have advanced degrees that are fucking idiots. They yeah. couldn't they couldn't pour couldn't pour piss out of a boot if you put the instructions on the sole. So, I, you know, it's not a panacea. There's a ton of merit in having something else, but you've got to have some sort of baseline requirement. What, what does that look like? You know, if you ask me, everyone ought to have a doctorate because I got my doctorate. Right. If you ask, if you ask a guy who's only got his GED, then, then that's, that's the requirement. So there's a happy place in there in the middle, you know, that's ROTC was designed because not everybody could go to West Point, and OCS was the was the was the the stopgap that was was designed to get experienced guys into the operational force. So, you know, is it time to relook it? Absolutely. And as soon as the Department of Defense commissions you and I to put together a million dollar study on that, we'll solve that problem, right? Yeah, I just think it's a. Uh, I think in this day and age that I get I get that it's a it's a confirmation that the, the candidate can undertake a task and then see it to completion, which is what a lot of people see college as like, Hey, look, he, he, we all know a lot of this stuff in college is BS. The whole point of it is seeing that I can push through all that and, and seek the end, meet my goal, which is the degree at, right. the, end of the, at the rainbow. Yeah. It, it demonstrates some discipline. It demonstrates some rigor, you know, but, but you know, but so does a four-year enlistment, you know, so does a four-year right. enlistment. If you get it That's to the end right. of a four-year enlistment and you are, you know, ex exceptional in your duties, you're showing, you know, leadership and stuff like that. How is that not a better candidate right out the gate, you know, for, for a possible officer slot than a kid, like you said, maybe graduated with a, a bachelor of fine arts and something 
And, you know, I just don't. And the other aspect, too, is that I think we we just, in this day and age where everyone's pushing college and stuff like that, and I think it's known and that people are, you know, really trying to revive the amount of interest that there are in trades and stuff like that and these skills, why not – why not also accept someone that's been a apprentice and has gone on to a full journeymanship within the trades? How is that not a yeah. good candidate? Because they've gone through that. I mean, especially if you want to direct, bring them in for a specific job. Like if I'm a, if I'm a construction guy and I've been doing it for a few years and I'm a, and I'm no longer an apprentice, I'm a journeyman. I've been like a team leader or whatever, or maybe I'm working into a project management kind of position, you know, or into that general how am I not suitable for like an engineering officer position? You know what I'm saying? I'm, I've in, already, I've already started ways, working. More suitable. Exactly. Yeah, in many ways you're a better candidate. Absolutely. Particularly a guy that's got a, you know, a degree in gender studies or something like, I don't know how valuable that would be to us. And, and so I think there's a ton of merit in that argument. And I'd love to see that, but, but, but who, who's going to make that decision? Right. I'm pushing it on the podcast. I bring it up every once in a while. I'm hoping someone, I think it's a great idea. I'm hoping someone of note hears it and goes, you know what? This is, this is kind of right. We need to get away from this, like, um, uh, almost caste system. Like I said, only 25% of the American public even goes to college. So how many of those are graduating? How many of those are even, um, qualified to join the military? I think it's a bad, I think it's a bad, um, a bad system that has worked, but is slowly not working as, college becomes less i don't know college in probably 1920 was different it's less than college rigorous. Is now it is absolutely less rigorous than it used to be yeah. it, it, so so here's here's the this is the age old discussion training versus education training is a conditioned response to known stimuli right so i'm training i'm firing my weapon the weapon jams i perform rem- uh, uh, immediate action right i sl- sports slap on the magazine pull on the charging hands of the chamber release tap squeeze you okay that's a conditioned response to known stimuli when i when i'm under attack i i, I battle drill one alpha right so so education is the opposite of that education is acquisition of knowledge for further for later application, right? So I train for the known, I educate for the unknown. That is the that is the, the age-old distinction between training and education. Officer education, NCO training, right? But but what we find now is that we have refined our training apparatus so much that it's not just conditioned response to known stimuli. It is also, to your point, asking the why, right? So we've we have adapted our training so that it is much more education like. So so now our and the expectation of our junior soldiers and particularly NCOs is that they are able to deal with the unknown, right? How many times have you shown up to a mission and the commander turned to you and said, figure it out? Like he waved his hand over the valley and said, figure it out. And you're like, figure what out? And he was like, yes. And you're like, fuck, how do I do that? Right. That so if if you are not, you know, broadly educated, not necessarily with a degree that confirms it, but broadly educated in critical thinking and 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 establishing mental models and heuristics and and analytical frameworks, you know, those are fancy academic terms for like not being a dumbass. Like 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 there ought to be a mechanism to quantify that so that we can take advantage of those guys and put them in in positions that we need, right? And so, so there's a ton of merit there, and and uh, and, and we are seeing that that because there is such a broad spectrum of what a college degree could be, that uh, that not everybody that has a degree is important. And interestingly enough, you know, back in the mid mid to late '90s, and 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 a little bit later, when uh, the tech boom was in full swing, we saw these big tech based companies like Google. That had that were built on engineers, and engineers are unique in that they think in, in the way engineers do, and they had elevated all these engineers. You, the way you became a senior, a CEO, or, a, or in the C-suite in these t- tech companies is was you came up through the ranks as an engineer because they are unique. They did not necessarily have the skills and the humanities that 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 those organizations needed. So what you had is you had these guys that couldn't didn't have the intuition of a person that has a had a broad liberal arts education in the humanities, philosophy and languages and all that stuff, all the social sciences. He had the hard sciences and the social sciences and they couldn't relate to people. So you had this surge of um, HR related incidents Mm -hmm. because you had these senior executives 
who were who were nerds and engineers and couldn't relate to people. So you had a little bit of a resurgence where like, hey, we need to have people in our leadership structures that have like a humanities degree, like a liberal arts degree. Like send me, send me somebody from, you know, Davidson College with a degree in liberal arts. I don't necessarily need a guy from MIT with a with a with a terminal degree in 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 computer sciences because I, I need like a human at the helm here to to sort of balance it. It goes back to that balance, right? Yeah. Innovation versus pushing the brakes. So so um I, I think that look, look at look at our founding fathers. When our founding fathers uh, got went, you know got educated, they didn't get technical degrees. They were broadly educated. There's an entire curriculum called the Great 100. It's the it's the best 100 books of the time. You know, Homer's Homer's Odyssey and the Iliad and and Plato's Republic and and all those books. There was a, that that used to be you could get a degree in the Great 100. And now we call that classical education, and and it's it's making a huge comeback. There's a there's a big movement to have classical, um, uh, have classically educated students that are brought up in a classical education. It's you know back to the big Latin and 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 the humanities and philosophies, and um and if, and obviously most of those are faith based now because that's the stuff that kind of lingered. But you're gonna you're gonna I think you're gonna see a resurgence in the next decade of classical education. And you're going to see colleges, you're, you're already seeing that many colleges, they call it their honors college. So it is a, it, because the people that come out of that are incredibly well educated. Yeah. 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 No, I can, uh, the, uh, college industrial complex is, uh, kind of reeling right now. Cause a lot of people are realizing how, how much of it is just a money grab, you know, for these universities and stuff, especially when you look at their staff growth over the last decade, which has caused, you know, tuition growth over the last decade, you know, and it's like, but the students aren't really getting anything more out of it. Yeah. You know, they're getting the and, same and education eight, for three times as much. Yeah. In the last decade, an 8% increase in, in faculty, a 270% increase in administration. And then, and of course, costs. 400 percent increase and and the, what's the outcome are students smarter now than they were before no this is this is the this is what regulation gets you if you impose a bunch of regulation on an industry then you create the need for regulators administrators you mm-hmm. impose you know, the, the 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 probably the greatest failure in the federal government's entire history is the income tax and the department of education since we established the department of education in the 70s Every single metric by which we measure education success has gone down. And yet we still say, oh, we need more money. Like, no, no you don't. Like, get rid of the Dubai. My first, you make me king for a day. I'm, I'm, I'm gutting the ATF and I'm gutting the Department of Education. They're both gone. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, I mean, I no, I'm, uh, it's sad, man. It's a really a sad situation, you know, and it's, a lot of it is, the unfortunate reality of how much politics has bled into like every aspect of our life. Um, I remember, so like we were talking before we came on, I, when I got out of the Marines, I was going to SDSU and that was during the pandemic. And I remember telling some of the other students, I'm like, dude, I can't believe you guys are paying for this shit, man. I'm like, if it wasn't for the GI bill, I would have already dropped out. Like, cause yeah. this is online. We're going through zoom instructors are having us watch YouTube videos, you know, like why, why would you pay thousands of dollars for the instructor to turn around and give you the resource that's free, you know, like we right. just go to the resource and it's because we're all chasing that piece of paper. I was doing it because yeah. why not? I got a free education, you know, I got, I'm, it's being funded. Why not go ahead and do it? You know, that right. was my, and, and you were told that's the pathway to success. You, you go to college yeah. and you get a better job, right? Yeah. But at the same time, I didn't necessarily believe that was, is why I was going. I was going because I had I so I, I I think I chose to to go because I had the opportunity to. You know what I'm saying? It was completely paid for. And it's one of those things where I don't understand people that leave their GI bill on the table, you know? They um a lot of people think that you if you're going to use your GI bill, you have to go to a four-year school and you have to get a whatever degree and it's like no man, there's so many ways you can use your GI bill with technical schools mm-hmm. and all this other stuff. So you for me it's license. Yeah, exactly. For, exactly. For me I was like I don't want to leave this on the table. Um these benefits on the table, I'm going to use them. But what I did was what you know, again like we were talking a little bit before I came on the before we started the show is I when I got out of the Marines, I started my first website, the jkramergraphics.com and then um not long after I think I think it was afterwards. Um 
I started the podcast. The podcast might have been first. I can't remember. Um, but either way, I started those two things. And then as I was in school, I was like, well, I'm going to take classes that are going to help build this up because I'm, I'm doing something here. So I'm going to take classes that reinforce what I'm trying to do here. So I moved from a business administration degree when I, because I was like, uh, when I got out of the Marines, I had like 30 credits or maybe a little bit more from taking classes while I was in. And then I couldn't be undeclared. I had to get, I had to declare something. So I was like, I'll do business admin. And quickly I was like, after one semester, I was like, yeah, fuck this. This is like, this is like cubicle, you know, city right here. This is where I'm headed if I keep on with this. So I switched to a journalism and advertising degree. And I was like, this right here will help me understand how I need to be marketing myself, maybe understand how to make my show better. And to, that's what, that was my thought process in the beginning afterwards. And, and to anyone that's listening to this, that, that is thinking the same thing. I got way more out of watching YouTube videos on how to produce something or, or whatever, than going to school for it. But I was getting paid to go to school. So that gave me a little bit of flexibility because you get your tuition paid for and you get your basic allowance for housing, which gives you money every month so that you can pay your rent. So because that gave me a little bit of wiggle room, I could struggle through figuring out how to run a website or create a podcast and stuff during that time frame that I'm in school. And by the time I, my goal was like, okay, by the time I'm done with school, I want this to be at or close to being able to um, sustain me as a job, you know, this be my job. And right. so I, I use it as kind of like an, ed, you know, it was an educational experience, obviously, because like an incubator, you know, I was trying to like focus classes on stuff or use projects that I could, or focus projects and stuff on that stuff that would benefit my business, you know, put, or help me in, learn in more direct things. application. That's exactly. Right, yeah. You know, and I think you have to do that. If you're going, if you're 22, you're getting out of the Marines and you're like, I'm going to school and you're just going to party and stuff. I mean, that's cool but get something out of it. You know, don't just go right. and get hammered and have a good time. Cause all your buddies got to do it. Now it's your turn. Uh, and right. you're a little late to the party. Uh, get something out of it. Like, uh, why am I taking this class? Ask yourself, why am I taking this class? What am I getting out of it? You know? So, yeah. Yeah. So it, I was just going to say, I'll, 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 I'll put a button on that by saying that, that, what you have just described is one of the adult learning principles that has to be relevant and applicable immediately. So that 22 year old Marine that's getting out after his first deployment, he, he will go to college if he want, or after his first, uh, first enlistment, he'll go to college. He'll do that drinking and partying and that'll, that'll be fun for about four months. Mm -hmm. And then he'll, he, he will immediately need the relevance to that. He'll have to have to be applicable. He wants a return on that investment you know, emotionally and, and on the, on the money. And so, uh, so seek those opportunities, just like you did, you picked business administration because you had to, but, but if, if you were, if, if you were able to mentor yourself from years ago, you would have probably said, Hey, pick something that's going to going to help you with your website and with your podcast and with your future plans. Don't pick something just because that's what everyone else is doing. That's literally why I picked it too. I was like, well, I mean, kind of everybody gets out and tell you while you're in the military, like corporations are looking for people like you, they need this. And I was like, well, I might as well do business admin, I guess, until I figure, you know, whatever. And then I, you know, just taking the classes, it was, I learned stuff. I mean, business statistics wasn't the greatest class, but at least I learned a little bit of skills on, uh, on Microsoft Excel that I didn't know. Sure. Uh, my Microsoft Excel experience, what I thought was experience in the Marine Corps was like making rosters on one. And then I get to this like class. I'm like, Oh, you know, pivot table. You can do formulas. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. all this other stuff. I was like, Oh, I have I haven't been scratching the surface of what it, this can do, but yeah, man. Um, it's, it's been a wild ride. It's, for the people out there wondering what you're going to do when you get out, don't worry. Everybody doesn't, no one knows what they're doing. Everyone's just, you know, wandering through the abyss, hoping it's all going to work out. And we my, are all just making it up as we go. And you know what? I told guys on my way out that were like, I can't believe you're getting out at 12 years. You know, you're a staff sergeant. You're all, you're about to pick up gunny. You know, I can't believe you're doing this. And it was like, you know what, man? Like if I fail at what I'm doing, I know a lot of morons back home that are surviving somehow. So if this doesn't work out for me, I'll go back home and, you know, work in a factory or something and just like live I got life. A but I'm back. I can make it happen. Yeah, but I, but I got to give it a shot, man. You have one life to live. And it's like that, that transition time after the military is one of those opportunities that a lot of people, it opens up a door for a lot of people to try something that they never thought of before or that they thought they could never get into. That's like we talked about at the beginning. 
this um this uh self defeatist like attitude is not good and when you get out you need to look at like what are the actual opportunities i have what is it i want to do you know what i'm saying if i want to be maybe i want to be a film maybe i want to be the camera guy for hollywood film somebody's got to do that job and the odds are that dude is just a regular guy and he figured out how to carry a camera and he just kind of chipped away and did more and more until he got experience you know, and, and I think a lot of people need to realize that a lot of these people are just regular Joes and they weren't afraid to fail publicly in front of people and learn. Um, and that's why they're now, you know, the best in their business. It's that risk reward. It's that risk reward. What are they, what are they willing to risk? You, you're only going to get out. You're only going to get out of it. What you're willing to put into it. hundred percent, man. Hey, this has been a really good conversation. Uh, David, I think people should need to go check out your book, you know, uh, rock up or shut up. And then your website, you, you, or you, where all can people find you at? So my website, tf, tfvoodoo.com is where uh, is my home base. And then, of course, I'm on Instagram at, uh, at tfvoodoo. I'm the guy that does special forces uh, training for uh, for young candidates. So look me up and uh, and uh, check out the book. I got some, uh, some funny stories in there and uh, some interesting narratives. And in I think I'll tell you a lot about uh, about not just about what special forces is about, but about, about what the nation needs to be about if we want to sustain you know, this, this great democratic experiment. So I, I appreciate you having me on and I, I learned as much as I hope I, I hope I taught. hundred percent, man. It's been a really good conversation. Uh, as always, people can find my stuff. JKramerGraphics.com is my website. If your unit company, whatever is looking for a bulk order, you guys want shirts and stuff, hit me up. I can help you with the design. Uh, former action guys is my uh, Instagram, former action news also. And that's it, man. It's really good. Uh, really good combo. Cheers. Thanks. Yeah.